coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, what's up? Uh, Chad here. We're at Marin Heavy Athletics in Marin County, California. Uh, we're up in the Bay Area for a Team Juggernaut training camp for, uh, with our weightlifters. So we came out today to visit uh, Yasha Fay, the owner and head coach here at Marin Heavy Athletics. He, uh, he and Max used to lift together back in the day. He was a very high level uh, lifter, particularly junior, a junior American record holder, um, and has served as a USAW board member for the last four years. So we're excited to talk to him about his experiences in the sport and where he sees, sees things going in the future. Social media whore, Yasha Fay. I'm <laughs> joined today by, by a USAW board member and social media whore, Yasha Fay. <laughs> We're joined by USAW, guy, USAW heartthrob, Yasha Fay. That's right. I have a guy who every time you show up here, he's like, the YouTube guy. <laughs> <laughs> I got recognized by a guy at some random diner in Seattle. That's he was awesome. obviously like Jack, dude, sitting at the table. And he's like, Are you Max Ada? Was like, Jack, or did he have a pair of body? No, he did. He was the first fan that was Jack. Like, legit Jack. Yeah. And he's like, Are you Max Ada? I was like, Yeah. He's like, I've watched all your stuff and I never do any of it. And look how good I look now. <laughs> that, how, how long have you guys known each other? I've known of Yasha since the day I started lifting because we had the same coach. So golf coached me when he moved to Montana and probably the first day I was there he was telling me stories about Yasha. Okay. But we probably met officially 2003, four. Whenever I came out there, uh, you guys were training in a high school. Yeah, NS High School. NS yeah. High School, I don't remember what year it was, but it was a long time ago. 15 years ago yeah. maybe, yeah. yeah. So it's been where, a while. Were you living the squat every day life as well yes yes when when i was competing and training yeah, yeah twice a day most days uh considerable amount of um intensity and not a ton of volume uh, golf it, was probably a little different back then right i mean he was because you i remember when i was with golf we didn't do anything but the lifts and i knew you guys would do like it seems to me whatever golf did it was we're going you know, we're going for broke, no matter what it was, we whether were, it's like dumbbell incline press or... <laughs> one of our max dumbbell incline just, press. Which well, we did. Just whatever it was, it was, we're going hard. We were very much a Petri dish for him. Yeah. Um, and he'll tell you as much. Uh, he didn't know much about weightlifting when he started coaching. He just had a group of kids that were excited to do it. Um, and then I came in on the second wave of golf stars, you know, and... Uh, I'm not saying I'm a star, but I'm saying he. I was in the second group of, of athletes but, where. But not not saying. Not. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm heavily implying that I was a star. I'll but, say it then take it back. Yeah, uh, but we we were training three or four times a week on the you know the American paradigm of the time when yeah. we went to the junior nationals and we met a kid who was a 56 kilo lifter and he outlifted almost everybody at the juniors and we said what what the fuck are you doing and he said I train twice a day. I have this Bulgarian coach. Uh, who incidentally I think was Angel Spasov, oh, okay. uh, who had come and done a tour before anybody did a tour. Um, and so we said, fuck it, let's try it. And we came to Steve and we said, are, we want to lift in the mornings. And he, th he said, what, before, you want to train more twice a day? And he, okay, if, he, if you kids are willing to do it, I'm willing to do it with you. And it kind of took off from there. So the, the learning curve was together, you know, and, and he kept telling us to do something and we kept going, okay. You know, like, if you smash your head against this wall <laughs> really hard, you, you know the, you know the yeah, routine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eventually so, the wall will break. Yeah, and you will not lift any more weight than you did before. <laughs> no, but really everything he said, every, we, we tried and everything he said was, yeah. was bond. We weren't, a real drawback today to the internet sensation is we weren't, we didn't get our, anything muddied up by what we saw other yeah. people doing. We had to take what he was telling us at Bond, and like I said, we'd go to other meets and talk to other athletes, and we'd take what we could, but yeah. we were very much a Petri dish in everything we tried. And you know, it's one of those things where if we were doing ping pong or table, t you know, 
we would have been excelling yeah, because yeah. we had a positive leader and yeah. we had somebody that was willing to try new things. So that's what yeah. that was like. It's funny because it's like, it seems like now, like you said. Let's go, Deb. Sorry. That's all right. We got the collars on this yeah. time. Yeah. Nice. Come on. Keep happen. it close. Let's go. Get up. Yeah, Yashi's yeah, pizza very I tough. to speak to you about. Yeah, <laughs> very, very tough. So yeah. what were your best results as a lifter? I snatched 165 kilos, and I clean and jerked 200. Sort Isn't of, that junior American record? Yeah, you know, the junior American record was 163, and I pretty much didn't progress after my, my uh, teenage years. But I did 163. I broke Mark Henry's uh, national record um, in 1993. Sexual yep. chocolate. The, the <laughs> mighty sexual chocolate, the one and only. Not many people get to say that they broke one of Mark Henry's lifting records. Yeah. I'm so, very, well, pr I'm very, very proud of that fact, and I say that as often as I say I broke the record. I throw it in that it was Mark's <laughs> record. Hey, Mark. Yeah, and, uh, it's important you know, to mention who had it. He was 400 pounds when he yeah. broke it. Uh, let's try and get him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. that'd be good. We'll you still him. talk to Mark? Yeah. 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 I still text with him. You know. Yeah, he's a, a man of the people. Yeah. 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 So you were so you're training in Montana? No, no, no. You were right here, here right? in Marin County. Oh, okay. uh, Steve was a San Francisco cop. All right. Uh, who lived in Fairfax, which is a town about 10 minutes from here, um, and he would before work in the city. He worked the one of the hardest beats in San Francisco uh, in the Tenderloin, which is still a tough place to work. And he'd come to the gym at five in the morning, coach us. Drop most of us off at school on his way to work, and then drive work at the in the loin all week, all day, and then come back and coach us in the afternoon. And he didn't accept a dime. Yeah, well, for it. The uh, such a dedicated guy. So after the time with Steve, you had a stint at the OTC as well. Yeah, uh, Steve was really great about pushing us out into the world. He's a lot of coaches you see, and I'm sure you guys yeah. have dealt with this directly. Some people don't want to let go of the talent that they have, or they don't want to admit that somebody else may or may not know more than them. But Steve was really great. He frequently had us at the Sports Palace with Jim Schmitz. Any time, any opportunity he had to get us exposed to other people. And then when the resident program at the Olympic Training Center opened up, he made a big push to get as many of his guys out there because he wanted the best for us. That's it. Yeah. You know, there was no cronyism or weird, you know, he, he wanted really the best for us. And, and he, he continues to. You know, he calls me every every week like I'm still competing, you know, just to ask me how things are going. Again. Yep. Yeah. So, and be ready, Deb. Just blast out of the hole. Get right up with it. Yeah. So then at the OTC, it was Dragomir? Yeah, was Dragomir. And, um, you know, uh, it was the first time I had a technical coach, to be honest. Steve is a very emotional coach. And, and uh, you could see when you look at Steve's athletes, almost none of us look the same as the other one, whereas... You go to some camps and it's obvious they're, oh, Everyone's those are all from yeah. Mike Cohen's gym or those yeah. are all, you know, we, we were on our own technically. And when we got out to the OTC, it was the first time anybody really cared to help me with technique and it made a big difference, to be honest. Come on, let's go. Rack and stand, jump right up. Go! Not uncommon to have homeless people oh, yeah. hanging out right here. I've chased a few one day, there was some heavy pungent odor rolling through the door and I came out here and there's like a homeless man with the hugest bag of ganja I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> you, don't, you can't afford rent, but you can afford this like, <laughs> bag of California's finest. That's awesome. Yeah. So as, as you shift to the OTC, you get started training with Dragonair. And the, the program was much different besides actually having technique. Completely different. Um, we went from, you know, what, what you would call a like Bulgarian Greek golf program to a, a very Russian Romanian kind of way more volume. Um, a lot of assistance exercises, which I did almost none of at the time, you know. Uh, uh, so it was a big change. And, I, you know, I see value in, in, in both of those. But yeah, we had a big, uh, it was a big shift for me. I'll never forget the first day I walked into uh, the, f the very first morning workout at the Olympic Training Center. And Tommy Goff, my coach's son, was already there. He was already 
making progress, but he was sort of my, like when you have a big brother in the, in the high school and you're a freshman, you don't get picked on as much, right? So I rolled into the gym and I was, and I was getting ready to do my first heavy back squat workout and I was wrapping my knees really tight and I looked up and everybody was staring at me and Tom gave me a very subtle shake of the head. Nope, we don't do that because nobody at the training center wrapped their knees, wrapped their wrists, used straps. Come on, aggressive, keep it close. Let's go, rack and stand. Go! Oh. Cut, 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 cut. Um, so yeah, they, they did things a lot differently there and uh, that was my intro was the don't wrap your knees in front of the coach, you know. And, uh, what, what was the biggest difference? I mean, I kind of know like... Massive amounts of volume. Um, sorry for interrupting you. Oh, they, no, uh, uh, I, Dragomir's whole system was a math equation. At the end of the week, you knew how many reps you did above 75% and at what intensity and, uh, and uh, in what lifts. It was broken down lift by lift by lift and what the projection was, what you were expected to do and what, how these reps would add up to success in competition. Right. You did pretty well there. What was your total going in versus finishing? I showed up there with a, a 287 total as a junior. I was invited out there with a 287 total and I think after... A year and a half, I did a 350 total. Wow. And uh, I mean, yes, I was maybe, that was, maybe that was two years. I don't remember the timeline of it. But I mean, it was, I came from a, a, a background myself on a personal level where I was barely eating. I didn't sleep that much at night. Uh, the, the home life wasn't ideal. So going to a place where I had sports medicine and yeah. food and uh, you know, constant care, literally designed to make me a better athlete, it made me a much better athlete, you know. Nobody going into that would have looked at me and said, this kid's setting the world on fire, but it took a few hot meals and a bed for me to really, really yeah. excel out there. Yeah. So, you know, as an athlete, you have these two very distinct kind of experiences and exposures to very different styles of training. Now as a coach, you know, running, running the gym here, how have you sort of, you know, merged those two or, what, what are you taking from each, from each style? I do, I use both styles. It's one, it's dependent upon the athlete. Some athletes have the, uh, the physical constitution to do a more, more Bulgarian style system, which tends to take a bigger toll, in my opinion, uh, physically and emotionally. Um, and some athletes are better suited for that, but mostly we do the more uh, Russian style. Here we go. Keep it close. Go, go, go. All right, all right, back down. Okay. Um, most of what we do here is a version, of, a kind of a hybrid version of both of those where the preparation phase uh, or, or strength phase or whatever everybody calls it out on the internet is spent doing a ton of volume and pushing the squats and all the assistance exercises and I'm still using new stuff that's coming in uh, that, you know, people are bringing out now, you know, CrossFit has brought a lot of new uh, information, but it's basically the same big broad brush strokes. I use the, the Russian Romanian system that Dragomir taught me and then leading into a competition, we change gears and focus on a Bulgarian yeah. program where we do a lot less squatting and pulling and a lot more lifting. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of where a lot of people lose sight of what the Bulgarian system is, is like, it's just peaking. It's yeah. the end. It's the end part of the training. And for those guys, it was the end part of the training because they everything had been built for years towards this. Yeah. And yeah, like it, it's a peaking program. I, for I, that, it's great. I yeah. agree, and I think that a, a big misconception about the Bulgarian program and what you what you to, to your point is that everybody assumes that what they see when they see the videos and they the footage and the training manuals is that that's how they've been training their whole life. Yeah. In order to show up yeah. at, in front of Abhijayev, you would have done a million back squats, a million pulls, yeah. and a million push presses in your life. Yeah. And then you're refined enough and you're at a level enough where you can take that kind of work. It's a, this is a long game. Weightlifting, yeah. you don't just show up and start training Bulgarian or you will have a short career. That's yeah. it. So. so what do you think, like, like, your approach psychologically with people versus, like, you know, in terms of competition and, and how you approach treating athletes, I mean, do you find that you use a lot of the stuff that Goff did or you sort of take a lot of that stuff from Dragomir? 
I would say both. Um, the, the golf stuff serves me best on competition day. Um, you know, he's a real motivator and getting to know each athlete individual, uh, individually and what makes them tick and what motivates them is really, uh, you know, the crux of, of the coach-athlete relationship. Day to day in here, um, my, my paradigm has changed. I don't coach like either of my coaches did because every athlete that was in front of Steve Goff or in front of Dragomir was there willfully because they wanted to be part of uh, a and bigger, you've a bigger your thing. Athletes in here. Yeah, this is a hostage situation. No, but what I mean is, is like this is uh, not everybody in here is trying to make the Olympic team. Yeah. Not everybody in here wants to even compete in weightlifting. So I don't coach them like that. I coach them. Uh, many of them co use weightlifting for health and well-being or general strength. The, right. the, the percentage of lifters that are as obsessed as I was is, is small. And both of you guys know that it's not for health or well-being. No. It's for yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, very much so. There is, there is two different kinds of weightlifters in America, and that's the ones that do it for fun and community and yeah. fitness and health, which, believe me, you can get a great workout doing clean and jerks and snatches and squats sure, yeah. as, as much as you can on a bike or a treadmill. And then there's the ones that can't sleep at night because they think about their numbers and yeah. the, the food that they're going to eat and the amount of sleep and the care that they're going to get because everything literally revolve, revolves around extra kilos. And you and I live that life and that's not how the bulk of my clientele in here yeah, yeah. trains, you know? So I don't, I don't yell at people. There was some physical abuse in my youth. I remember. Uh, our coach, um, many of my coaches, it was a different time. It was, there was yeah. no cameras around and it was a lot less litigious. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So things were different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely. And then, and then the other, the other big major difference is that weightlifting is a women's sport in America right yeah. now. It's it's mostly women lifting. Look in this room right now. It's mostly women here. There's yeah. a few men, and 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 they're you know just as motivated. But you coach women differently than you coach men. Um, How so? There's a lot less, you know, women come in here and it seems like they know what they want to do and they're here for the reasons yeah. that they say they're here for. A lot of the men have some kind of... They're here for the women. Yeah, for the women or there's some ego trapped in what they're doing or uh, you, they, they're not lifting weights for the... It's a lot easier to coach women without shaming them or like bullying them into, into trying a heavier attempt or pitting them against each other, which is what right. tends to happen a lot more with the men that I coach. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and in addition to your role as, as you know coach, or athlete coach, now for the last, what, three, four years, you've been on the board member at USAW? Yep, about four years, I think. And in that four years, I mean, of, of all four-year periods in the history of USAW, the last four years has probably been the biggest change. The most profound changes have come, and the most positive and, and successful changes have come. And, and, you know, mostly because of my involvement in the board. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm definitely a part of that. But uh, we have a great leader right now. Um, the, the office at the Olympic, uh, it's not the Olympic Training Center anymore, but out in Colorado Springs is, is uh, better, better and more effective than it's ever been. Um, I'm really quite proud of the changes that we've made. Uh, so, yeah, the last four years have been pretty productive. The first year, I'd say, was spent kind of treading water, kind of undo a lot of the damage that had done, been done by previous administrations. Not to say that they hadn't done wonderful jobs, but... Uh, the, the, Not to say that they had done wonderful Well, jobs. also, the, the scope and <laughs> spectrum of weightlifting has changed so much yeah. in that, that decade where they were still working on the past. They were working on the things that were normal for weightlifting before yeah. CrossFit and before the Internet, which has changed things drastically. Here we go. Let's go. Easy. A ton of positive changes in there. Um, and you know, big changes, it's the, the sport of weightlifting as a whole is changing internationally and I think the direction of these, these last couple of years. So insights, I mean, we were talking kind of before we started about new information about the qualifying process. Can you elaborate on that for us? So, um, unlike in the past, uh, where it's been the the athlete was selected based on their um, 
their country selection process, it's now been centralized to the IWF, and it, and it goes with the athlete. As long as the athlete is a member of, a, of an IWF member federation, they can score points at these events. Uh, so there's nice job. The new, the new, there will be eight, eight athletes per country, uh, with four per gender. That's it, maximum. Any any country, no matter what they score at the world championship. So there's no more team scoring right. is not going to place you on the Olympic team anymore. There's no more water bearers, meaning one person could be responsible right. for the whole team. Um, so how now, does that change? being that there's now it's an individual qualification right so how does that change with head coaching and team selection in the united states head coaching is still going to fall on the uh, responsibility of our national team coach um, who in theory because of our new decentralized system should be in direct contact with the uh, personal coaches um, and i imagine there's going to be some some room for coaching at the international level for personal coaches. I'm not exactly sure how that's going right. to pan out yet, but um, if everybody's doing their job, every, co every, every coach with an athlete on the national team or a potential Olympian sh should be talking to right. and communicating with our coaching director and our national, uh, our, our team basically, which is, you know, uh, Mike Catone and Piero Stimas. Um, which is a pretty solid couple of guys. Uh, yeah. I've personally seen them perform internationally at a few different meets, like right there in the in the warm up room, and they're they're great at what they do. Does, um, and does you know, Demos have any competition experience you know of as an athlete? Uh, uh, he's been he knows his way <laughs> around a barbell. Um, you know, it's funny because we've seen so he many did times. Did the AO too, and he placed fifth. So he placed he's, fifth. Uh, he's pretty he's good. National, national right. He's nationally ranked lifter. I think he's a level one coach. Uh, <laughs> You know, so often we see, um, in particular with international coaches and international superstars, um, they're great athletes, but they know almost nothing about coaching. Uh, Demas is not one of those guys. Yeah. He is really effective. And just walking in the back room as an athlete with, with, Demas. with Demas at your yeah. side, it's pretty, uh, it fires you up. One thing I think is funny. Let's go, Alex. Look at this wide ass grip. Let's go, Alex. Easy. Uh, one thing that I think is funny that you probably can can relate to having worked with like uh, Dragomir, but and I think this is one of those the biggest failures we've had with bringing other foreign people in is that it's not that they don't understand weightlifting or don't understand coaching or science or can't adapt. It's that they don't grasp the culture. So like Abhijay was monumental failure here, you, you know, in the global perspective because he didn't understand the culture, uh, and you know a lot of those guys have come in and uh, they just they didn't grasp the culture, the difference of you know what are American athletes like, what is what are American kids like, and so it's like a struggle. I think maybe even Small Search probably to some degree had something like that. Dragomir did. The, they adapt, they change as time goes on, but. Demos is the first guy I've seen come in that seems like he really understood it all before he got here. Like his kids go to school here, like he he gets it. So I think that probably contributes a lot to his ability to communicate. You know, like I agree. Um, and he he definitely came in and had a really easy segue. He's about yeah. our age too. He's a younger guy, yeah. so he, a lot of. Uh, the subtleties of our culture weren't wasted on him. Yeah. But, um, we definitely ran into a lot of trouble with that. Um, you know, I think you were there. Uh, yeah, good work. That first time we, we flew Demos out and we yeah, accidentally yeah. ended up at dinner with him one night. I, that was a memorable dinner. It was an amazing Golf dinner. Was there, Golf was there. Was there. Max's yeah. gym shirt? Uh, we gave him a Max's gym shirt there, but I believe I believe our former coach at some point called him fat. <laughs> oh, yeah. You remember? Goff said, what's going on? I put on a few kilos, uh, you know. Uh, the next it, day, wasn't he Demus in the gym? He was working out the next day. Oh. Goff got in Demus' head. <laughs> um, he channeled Yakovu. But, uh, but I'll never forget what he said to us that night. Um, Goff said something, or one of you guys asked him a question about, well, what about those athletes in America that have to work a full-time job? And... And, and still come in and train. And he very matter-of-factly looked at us and said, well, they can expect to not be that good. Yeah. And uh, that. that's the culture 
that's kind of lost a lot is yeah. like you, you want to be a weightlifter, you have to lift weights yeah. exclusively. Yeah. And now we've finally created a situation where many of our athletes yeah. at our top that's tier athletes change. are actually paid athletes. Yeah. They're yeah. getting a stipend that allows them to, to live a lifestyle where they can go get a massage three times a week, see a chiropractor, get the kind of health care they need, rest, sleep, not go work a nine yeah. to five job. And then it shows we, we have some standout athletes yeah. that uh, can compare to anybody in the planet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's it. With that's a completely different system. Nobody backing yeah. them. No, uh, you that's, know. A, that's a big one. Yeah. It's like the culture of training is, the culture of training has changed a lot in that like, before it was like it's never gonna we were all training, focused on training 40 times a week and like oh we got to do exactly what the bulgarians do yeah. or the russians and now it's shifted more to where people are finding success in you know their Let's own go. created versions of training programs yeah that's a lot thanks to crossfit i think easy i like that belt Oh, that was the, old, the old juggernaut belt. We made her put a sticker over it. Yeah. Um, that yeah, was very it's, nice. It's kind of neat to see, like, I want to say, like, almost like American ingenuity in that, like, we're creating our own thing now. Well, that's something that, uh, you know, before weightlifting was such a grassroots um, underground sport in America, and now it's become so mainstream that the information is just very pouring good. in. It's good. Yeah, so people kind of, you know, like, you get people that create their own stuff. It's not like, it's not like we don't learn from what's been done, but the, the sort of copy-paste thing doesn't exist as much anymore, which is you got to try pretty cool, hard to not make progress. Like yeah. If you show up and you lift weights on a decent program yeah. with a decent coach, you should make progress, yeah. you know. Um, Oh, that, yeah. Shoot. Leave it there. Do you still train? Yeah. But get your body getting better? Right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Gun to head, like your life, your children's life depended on it. I could probably snatch 90 to 100 kilos. <laughs> and then like be in the like Grave. ER. Yeah. PR or ER? <laughs> PR then ER. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of pain associated with those, those kind I, of lifts. I was watching you just laughing and cringing at the <laughs> oh, same time. Just hurt, like, like, hurting. What is this guy doing? Yeah. I thought it was some old TBT, you know, some no, throwback you know, Thursday. You get people Let's go. Good. Yeah, it feels good. really good. I feel like I'm actually doing it right overall more so than being wrong every time. It's getting better, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot not better. so not. Yeah. Here we go. Come on. One kilo more. Come on, get tough now. Go, Alex. Go! So, what is your thought on you know, sort of the, the future of USA lifting internationally now that you've, you've had a ton of exposure to, ton of exposure to competing internationally as a junior, coaching, seeing the change from, you know, the way things were to the way things are now, and then, you know, the future of, of with the doping and all this, and, you know, what is your kind of outlook on the future, predictions, or at least you just, know, you know. There was a time when I, and I was so just awestricken by the foreign lifters and the numbers that they put up. And then I would, we would have Americans that would be coming close and everybody would say, oh, if we had the talent that the NFL has or the NBA has and all these like, you know, all this um, anecdotal stuff about athleticism. And then all of a sudden we're in a place where we actually are excelling, we have people on the podium at world events, people beating historically dirty countries. Yeah. Um, and we're getting, weightlifting has become mainstream enough that we are getting some top yeah. level athletes, you know. Uh, uh, so the, the future looks bright for American weightlifting right now. Um, 
like I said, the women's weightlifting in America is exploding. It's, it's bigger than ever, and it seems to be growing, and the records keep getting broken. Um, records keep getting broken uh, on the men's side, and then we have world record holders now, like legit yeah. world record holders, beating Chinese and, and Russian and, and Kazakh lifters, uh, you know, in, one, in the most rigorous testing environment there is. The USA leads the world yeah. in, uh, in testing, so... Um, the future looks great right now. Uh, uh, we have great leadership uh, at, uh, with Phil Andrews and Mike Catone and, and the crew out there in Colorado. Um, I think big things are coming. We keep getting people in the top five, top ten. Our women's program is on fire. See, there's a good one right there. That looks great. Very cool. Yeah. yeah actually, where can they, people follow you on social media? Um, Marin Heavy Athletics uh, is my Instagram and Twitter and uh, Facebook handle. Um, my personal page, Yasha Fay, Strong Like Bull 73. But uh, yeah, Marin Heavy Athletics, that's the name of my gym, it's the name of my program. Cool, man. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks, yeah, of course. Thanks for coming out, you guys. This is yeah. fun. I was going to say, you know, culturally, uh, the big cultural change, I got a great story when Dragomir first came to the Olympic Training Center. Um, he said, okay, gen gentlemen, today we will sauna. And uh, we all piled into the sauna and Dragomir rolled in about five minutes later and he was completely nude. And and this he, is the hashtag safe sport. Yeah. Thing. And he <laughs> quietly looked around the room, saw that every one of us had a pair of shorts on and backed out of the sauna quietly and came back with a towel a minute later <laughs> after. <laughs> Just culturally a little different. All right, so that was our episode with Yasha Fay. Thank you very much to him hosting us here at his gym, Marin Heavy Athletics, uh, in Marin County, California, just north of San Francisco. And uh, make sure you go follow him on social media and, and on his spots. Uh, as always, if you're interested in online coaching, visit juggernautcoaching.com. We have powerlifting, weightlifting, strongman, super total, and power building. Uh, check that stuff out. And if you enjoy the Jug Life podcast, go on iTunes. Leave us a five-star review. We always appreciate that, and it helps more people find us. And uh, subscribe to YouTube, all that good stuff. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week.